Hey, it's Danielle Frank from Beauty Uncovered, sponsored by Olaplex. And I want to have a little conversation about small businesses. Why? Because 99% of all businesses in the United States are small businesses. And then on top of that, ever since 2020, a lot of people decided to quit their jobs and start their own businesses. Now, where does that lead with this podcast? Well, we are right now looking into going into our busy season as hairstylists for sure, but also for a lot of small businesses, this is the time to gear up. This is the time that we're trying to get ready to sell our products, uh, get people more engaged. But the problem is, is that, yeah, technically we're in a recession. So a lot of people are holding back on what they're spending. So how do you stand out? How do you get the opportunity to grab the attention of someone else? Well, in my industry, which is, of course, you know, the beauty industry, we all turn to Brit Siva. Now, Brit Siva is the host of The Thriving Stylist, but she has worked with small businesses across the board. She talks a lot about becoming more organized, you know, so this way you can have a more intention in your business. Um, she likes to make sure we're charging our worth for sure, but also living that holistically wealthy lifestyle um, because we all want that in our lives, don't we? Um, and also what I love is that she talks about that recession and how the pandemic has changed the way a lot of consumers are purchasing products or choosing who they want to do business with. Because now, if they're going to spend their money, they want to make sure they're getting the value that's almost above and beyond what's being offered. And how can you do that? So with that being said, let's tune in. Britt, I am so excited that you're here today. I've had so many people send me questions to ask you. So I thank you for coming on today. It is my absolute pleasure. Um, and it made me so excited when you say people have submitted questions. This is my favorite time to just kind of strip it down and get back and, and get into some great conversations. So I'm excited to be here today. Well, I mean, kind of like we were talking, you and I were talking beforehand how Yes, you have, are the host of The Thriving Stylist. You are working with a lot of hairstylists that are small businesses, either independent or salons. But really, all the tips that you have is incredibly universal. It is. And, and, you know, it's funny because I think that in our industry, I don't know how it happened. It happened over a course of decades and we've all played a little tiny piece of it, but we've really overcomplicated what it looks like to be a successful stylist or a successful salon owner. And like you and I were chatting before, it comes down to really great, practical, simple business common sense that unfortunately none of us were taught in beauty school. And I think a lot of the overwhelm comes from just not knowing some of the really great, simple basics. And I've built my business around around just breaking it down and keeping it easy. And it's been such an incredible journey. I think of, of the stuff that we did learn in, in beauty school when it came to starting the business. And that was more like, how many chairs do you have? How right. Many, it was like, like design of your salon <laughs> and less about all the other pieces. But I want to ask you, so tell me a little bit about your background and how you started to get into the industry of consulting and to helping stylists really, um, create balance in their work life, because that's a big one, but also really succeed on a much more sustainable way. Yeah. So I'll be honest, I, I kind of created the business th that I wish existed for me when I was a new stylist. Mm -hmm. So I am licensed in the state of California. I went to cosmetology school in 2007 and started working in a salon in 2008. And I was totally that naive young 20 something who thought, you know, you go to cosmetology school, you get your license, you make a hundred thousand dollars a year and life is great. And then you realize pretty quickly how, how naive that is. And, um, I ended up joining an incredible salon team with a great assisting program. I was very well mentored. And even in, I really think I was in one of the best of the best environments. Like I, I ended up choosing a great spot for myself. Even so, I looked around and none of the stylists that I was working with were living the, what I call wealthy life that I had dreamed was possible as a hairstylist. I wanted to, I was a teen mom. So I already had a little girl and I, I dreamed of 
being able to watch her play soccer, um, being home on the weekends with her, cooking dinner at night, picking her up from school, chaperoning field trips, and still making a great living as a stylist. That's really what I thought I was getting into. And I looked around at the incredible people I was working with. Some were making a ton of money driving, driving beautiful cars, beautiful homes, but they were working nights, weekends, double columns. They were working really hard for it. And then I saw the part-time, for me, it was just working moms, part-time working moms, but man, they were struggling. Oh, and yeah. I thought, I thought, wow, nobody has it all. And I wanted it all. Like I was in it for it all. I wanted to be greedy. I wanted to have everything. I want to have the best of both worlds. So I realized pretty quickly, while these incredible souls could teach me how to cut, how to color, how to build a clientele, they weren't going to teach me how to have the life balance I was seeking. I was going to have to figure that out myself. And so I started, I started choosing to do almost the exact opposite of what the others in my salon were doing. I decided to market differently, communicate differently, because I realized if I did the same, I was going to get the same results. And so I had to shake it up and in doing things differently, it really, really worked. And so the owner of my salon pulled me aside one day and said, Britt, I see you. You love the business side. You don't love the hair. Would you consider stop taking clients and run the salon? He wanted to open a beauty school, which he did. He opened a, a really huge uh, beauty school in um, the Silicon Valley. So I was able to run a salon team. We had anywhere from 20 to 30 stylists at any given time. Um, I was able to run this multi-million dollar salon as like a 26 year old woman wow. um, for an absentee owner. And I learned a lot through that process. And in the time I was running that business, other salon owners started to take notice of what I was doing differently. And very graciously, the owner of my salon allowed me to consult one-to-one -one with these other salon owners. And this business I have right now grew very organically from that. I coached one-to-one -one for many years. And then once I, once I had really maxed myself out, I was still running the salon day to day and consulting fairly full time. Um, I took my education online. I ended up stepping away from my salon team in 2016. So I've been coaching full time since um, 2016. It's been an incredible ride. I, you know, and it's very funny because I think of marketing, even with small businesses, with salons, whatever it is. There's always been an element of like hometown, you know, word of mouth, uh, maybe put that advertisement out for whatever special there might have been. But business models have completely changed and not everybody is up to pace with it. I think a lot of people understand the power of social media, but not necessarily the breadth of what they could possibly do. I agree completely. So when I, when I joined the industry in 2007, 2008, there was no, I think Facebook was a thing, but it was very much still for college kids. Primarily, they were starting to do business, Facebook pages. Instagram was in its infancy. Mm -hmm. Um, there was no TikTok, And so it was different. So I did the whole, like pound the pavement, hand out cards. That was harder. That was so much harder. I oh, look yeah. at, Oh my gosh. And so we, we, we say to ourselves like, well, social media is very challenging. Believe you me, it beats the alternative. The reason why it's challenging is we didn't know we were signing up for it. It feels like a curveball and it's a new skill to learn. Um, like in the beauty industry, my daughter's in beauty school right now and she just got her first pair of shears. And she's like, oh, you can't hold these like you, you hold scissors. And I said, no, you can't. And it's, it's those little moments that make me realize that whenever we're learning a new skill, we think, oh, well, this should be easy. I know how to, I know how to hold scissors. I can cut hair. And then you get in and it's like, no, no, this is a totally different. Meanwhile, skill your set. hands cramping from holding it differently. She's already, I'm teaching her like the carpal tunnel exercises. She's like two weeks in. And it's, it's the same with social media. We think like, well, I'll just post pretty pictures and something great will happen. And when it doesn't, we tell ourselves, well, I'm not good at it. No, you just haven't learned it yet. And we don't give ourselves that grace. That's, it's a hard one because it, it, it is so progressive and it's constantly changing. Yep. And with businesses, it's very hard to catch up. Yep. It used to be the school of thought, you know, collect those emails and, you know, blast them all out or um, just stick to one social media channel and nothing else. But nowadays it's like very multifaceted because things are changing. Like people are hanging out in different places. I think that's such a good point. And you said something that sticks out to me. You said it's hard to catch up or it's hard to keep up. I think of social media, almost like, um, fitness training. I think that's a really tangible way to think of it. Yeah. If I decided I wanted to run a marathon in 30 days and I, I'm not a runner, that would be ambitious. That would be hard for me. Could I do it? Maybe, 
but I'd likely hurt my body. I'd likely have some breakdowns. It wouldn't be the best decision on my part, but I probably could if I really wanted to versus if I wanted to run a marathon, I started learning how to run. I started learning good principles. I changed the way I ate. I started to shift my hydration and I gave myself time to learn what it looks like to be a runner. Well, then training for that marathon becomes super easy. And I think we do that with social media. Yes, it is a beast. It is an Everest. If you don't every single month, try and learn a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more trying to catch up or keep up feels impossible. So at some point we just have to say, I'm going to learn this freaking thing. And I'm going to spend the next 90 days or six months to do it. And then as these little shifts and nuances change, it's not so hard because it's a pivot. It's not learning a whole new skill, right? I think there's some people that just make it seem so easy on social media, which is the MO that is social media in a nutshell, people making it seem like it's so easy, but even they had a learning curve. Totally. One of my favorite things to do. I don't know if you ever do this is I go back and look at somebody's messy social media beginnings because everyone looks terrible, but Mm -hmm. like myself included. I do it to myself. (laughs) Me too. All the time. And I love it because it's so inspiring to, and it gives you like a little pat on the back. Like, Oh, okay. I did figure this out. And to what you're saying, those who make it look easy are likely working the hardest to do it, to be candid or they have help, but, but they didn't wake up and just make it look easy. They've worked for it. And so it's like, if you want it to be easy and you, you want to understand it, you've got to put in the work for me at this point, social media is so dang fun, but it's because I I understand the system so I can just have a little fun with it. When Mm -hmm. it's not fun, it means that you've not learned the skills to master the system. Just like if color formulation is not fun, that's likely because you don't know what you're doing yet. So once we learn the skills, then we got it. So I I have a question from someone. Great. Um, They want to know the key of engaging consistent content without burnout. That's Mm. a big thing because we do get burnout when we're we're trying to constantly stay on top of the curve, put that content out there because we always hear consistency is key. So what do we do? I think that's a really great question. And for me, burnout almost always comes from lack of knowledge, lack of education, and lack of focused messaging. Mm. So um, I'll use myself for an example, and then I'll flip the script. For me, I could probably do 50 social media posts a day if I wanted to, because I know my target market consumer. I know who I'm trying to reach on social. I know their problems, and I know how to solve them. For me, when I look at social media, If you want to get high engagement, if you want people to choose to follow you, the key, this is all you have to do is provide solutions to problems. I think what we do and where we get it wrong on social is we say, um, beautiful photo of a client, beautiful photo of a client, beautiful photo of me, beautiful photo of a client. And you burn out on trying to caption that, right? It's, it's boring for you. It's boring for the viewer. We're not adding any value. I think if we look at social media through the filter of, I am here to add value to somebody's day and solve their problems. And even as you're driving in the car home from, you know, work or whatever, just let it kind of play in your mind. Like what were the, what were the concerns my clients came to me with today? What solutions did I have to their problems? That's 10 social media posts. Like, I don't know about you, but when I choose who I follow on social, it's people who provide recipes so that I can cook dinner for my family. It's people who teach me tutorials that I love. Like, those are the things we should be doing too. add the value. Funny, I always say, um, when it comes to any time that you're doing any kind of speaking engagement or any kind of social media aspect, one is always know thy audience know who you're trying to attract Yeah, because you know, if you're talking in one certain way it's going to appeal to a certain demographic. And if you're trying to attract a different demographic, you're in trouble. Yes. Yes. Good trouble. Um, and yes, I do agree. I think that, um, when you, things have to be purpose-driven and purpose-driven has to meet what their uh, need is for sure. Completely, completely. And I can be empathetic that I think some people feel like They've not found their message. They've not found their voice. They've not found their purpose yet. So how how do they find it though? So one of the things I'm big on, and I I coach to it in some of my programs is the idea of X factors. And I think that we as human beings don't 
don't see X factors the proper way. So your X factors and mine are completely different. We can't possibly have the same, but I think a lot of people at surface level think X factors are, well, I'm really great at haircuts. Well, I'm really great at baking cupcakes. Well, I'm real, I use XYZ extension brand. Those are not X factors. Those are just facts. Those can be interests. You and I can both be really great cupcake bakers. But likely, if we both open cupcake shops, one of us would be more successful than the other. More than likely, I don't know who it would be. It would depend on our X factors. X factors are the things that we as humans have that nobody else can duplicate. And it's based on life experiences. It's based on how we were raised. It's based on um, our values as human beings and people, how we want to communicate, how we want to show up, how we want to be perceived. And that's the stuff that can't be duplicated. And that's why I think a lot of people, like you follow an influencer on social media and you can copy them to a T. You can use the same right. color line they use, cut hair the same way, use the same extension brand, and they'll still take 10 times, make 10 times more money than you. How come? Because they're tuned into their X factors. And I know that sounds abstract, but for me, it kind of goes back to like self-confidence, authenticity. Um, finding your voice, understanding your values and like showing up in your most holistic truth. As we start to do that, it becomes a whole lot easier. That takes a lot of vulnerability. It, <laughs> and that, that V word is so hard. It's tough. That's a hard really tough. It is. It is. I think it's a very hard one for a lot of people to overcome because they want to have that separation. I get it. But it's like, no, nowadays, like people, much like when we have somebody in our chair and you know, there could be another hairdresser that is just as good as we are, but they choose to be with you because of you. Yes. I it's agree. the same with social media. I agree. Now here's, here's what I want to say. And I think it's, it's worth sharing. I am extremely private. So, um, I, I would bet money that none of my followers know my children's names. Um, I very, people know that I'm a mother. I don't show their photos hardly ever. Uh, people don't know my husband's name. It doesn't mean I'm not being vulnerable. I think there's a difference between vulnerability and I call it running around naked. Like, I think there's a difference between here's my everything. There's and, a lot of nakedness on social media. <laughs> hey, there is. And that sells, man. And if you want to do that, I'm, you know, more props to you. Um, no judgment, but, but for those who are more private, like I tend to be more private, you can be vulnerable and be values oriented and not share your, bear your soul. Like there, there is something in between. Um, and so play in, play in that arena a little bit and find like your version of vulnerability. This actually leads into the next question, which I think is really interesting that I have, that it just flows so beautifully. Isn't that amazing? Um, how to set and stick to boundaries within your business. Because that is a huge thing, because especially if you are one, like a gig contractor kind of person, or you're just starting your small business and you're like, I'm trying to hustle. I need to get as much as I can. And in many ways, we don't create boundaries in the beginning and then there's none. So how do you get to that point where you have boundaries and stick to it? I think that's a really good question. And you said something right at the end that I think is important where you said, how do we get to a place where we have boundaries and stick to it? So it's not that I don't think boundaries belong when somebody's starting up a business. I do. I think that there are mental health and physical health and safety boundaries that should always be in place. Yes, please. And thank you. And we should never feel a type of way for asking somebody to see themselves out the left Kindly or unkindly, if somebody has crossed a boundary with you, you are within your full right to do that every single day. However, while I do believe we're in the end of the hustle culture, I do believe that um, success is reserved for those who are willing to work hard. And uh, you can't be lazy and complacent and have a gajillion boundaries and expect to be wildly successful in the beginning. And so what I think, like I think of my young daughter who's just started cosmetology school, girl's going to have to work hard and she's going to have to work nights and weekends if she wants to build fast. Once she's built that base clientele, she should have boundaries. And for me, I share this very openly. I spent a lot of years. I'm an, I'm an Enneagram 3W2. So I'm a servant's heart. I love to teach. I love to help. I love to rescue. And so I spent a lot of years making other people's lives easier, mm -hmm. even if it made mine hard. The self-sacrifice. Which and I think a lot of hairdressers have. They, um, nurses, teachers, hairdressers are the three yes. most common. Mm -hmm. I believe it. I believe it. Yep. 
we're, we're cut from that same cloth. And it, it, for me, it came from realizing, um, it was building self self-confidence was huge, but realizing like, wow, if I keep making the lives of everyone around me easier, even if it makes mine harder, even if it makes me work with people I can't stand, work hours I don't like, work a schedule I, I don't appreciate, what I found was making all those sacrifices didn't help me to make more money ever. It never, ever translated into the result I was looking for. Um, and those who will take advantage of you will come back and do it over and over and over. It's like a, it's almost like a form of abuse, honestly. Um, when I realized like I'm sacrificing my marriage, I'm sacrificing my time as a mother, I'm sacrificing my self-care time, I am burning myself down to make other people's lives easier. That step one is realizing like the choice you're making and the impact you're having. And at the end of the day, those that we do all of these things for, we work overtime for, we come in late for, we stay early for, um, they actually don't appreciate it to the degree, the degree that you think that they would. No, without a doubt. I mean, Never. I even look at nowadays you're seeing all over all, well, certainly all over TikTok. I might spend way too much time on there. <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we all? Yes. But I, I do find that there is a huge push on a lot of people in that, I guess you would call it culture of corporate culture, where it is that hustle culture. And really there is no reciprocation. It is much the same as what yep. you're talking about. And yes, I do think that there is a pendulum swing. And yes, we, we might be ending that hustle culture and starting to have a little more self-care. But I do think that there, there, I agree. It has to, you have to be able to put the effort out in, in order to ex get the results you're expecting. I do think personal care is important, but how do you find that balance? Because a lot of people that are trying to right now grow and grow in their, whatever career they have, they're trying to grow, but they're also trying to keep that balance and not burn out too quickly. How do you keep that balance when you're just starting out? I think when you're just starting out, you kind of have to be almost flexible in what self-care means. So for me, I remember when I was starting out, like sometimes self-care was sitting on my backyard for 30 minutes, drinking my cup of coffee in the morning. And that was the self-care I got for the day. Yeah. And we can say like, I mean, I went years without even a vacation because I was hustling and I don't think we need to do those kind of extreme sacrifices anymore. But sometimes it's like, well, if, if watching TikToks for two hours doesn't feel like self-care, then take 30 minutes of that go read a book, go, you know, I, I think that for all of us, no matter how busy we are, we can find 15 minutes to meditate, sing a song loudly in our car because it makes us feel good. Sit in the backyard and drink a cup of coffee, like prioritize self-care and define what that means for you. I am still a believer in the idea that you have to make short-term sacrifice for long-term gain. Um, I'd be lying if I said that's not what got me to the place I am now. Um, now I'm in the place where I can have boundaries. And I, I decline a lot of podcast interviews. I decline a lot of coaching clients. I decline a lot of students. I decline a lot of speaking events. You better believe I took everything that came my way for yeah. years before I got to the place where I was able to put in boundaries. Um, but still, if I hopped on a podcast and somebody asked me an inappropriate question, I'd pull the plug in a second and be gone. Like I had that boundary always, but I think, I think asking yourself, like, where am I going? What are the steps I need to take to get there? Give yourself timelines of like, all right, I'm willing to work my little booty cheeks off for one year. But then after that, I, I'm going to need to have some, some guidelines and some boundaries and then hold, hold yourself to that. Like for a year, but maybe it. if you're not getting the results that you thought you were going to get, that's where you reassess. Exactly. And, and you're going to get experience during that year of hustle that you never thought you, that's the stuff we build up on. And I think there is a lot of people that think that, no, it should be this structure and there's no getting around it. But the truth is you're right. In order to sometimes get that edge, you got to put a little extra time in. I totally agree. And to what you're saying, like doing a handful of clients that you can't stand, that's how you learned what you don't like. Like, and until you get the experience and put yourself out there, you don't or even learn know how to have know. boundaries with those clients that have no boundaries. Cause you yes. don't necessarily know how to handle it until you've experienced it. Totally agree. Totally agree. Oh, I love it. I love it. Okay. I got another one. Um, how to automate as much as possible in your business. Mm. Which I think is interesting in the sense that, yes, I mean, social media does have a big um, play in that, what, regardless of what business you're in. 
but particularly for any kind of industry where it's a service industry, you would think automate, like you got to do everything yourself. This is a, it's funny. As you said that I almost got like a little butterfly in my stomach. This is a, this is a question for me. That's interesting because I first for, I started this coaching business speaking to automation. Um, when I started in 2015, still predominantly most, most beauty professionals used paper books. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of small businesses today still run on paper and pencil and, and don't, don't have a computerized booking system. That was like blew people's minds when I was talking about that seven years ago. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I started using that system because of you. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> you. I see you and I appreciate you because it was like, it was, it was so wild at the time, but yeah. now, now it's become normalized. So we realize, like, okay, online booking is turns out it's pretty great. And there is a lot of automation you can put in and it almost becomes like, well, if we can automate this, how much else can we automate? And we did that and we did that and we did that. And 2020 taught us a real lesson. 2020 is when the consumer said, Zhoop! and they kind of pulled the plug a little bit and said, I'm not just a cog in your machine. I'm a human. And one of the things that our clients demanded from us as salon started to shut down in 2020, I'm in California. So we experienced a really long shutdown. Oh yeah. I couldn't have predicted this, but consumers wanted their stylists checking in on them. Meanwhile, their stylist is unemployed for months at a time, but clients were like, well, what about me? There was this expectation that their stylist should be nurturing them. How are you? Are you okay? But it's that reminder of they really see us as that service person. Now, what happened as a result of that, 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 that shift in the consumer mindset's not going away. And I, and I use California as an example, but I believe it's worldwide. So there is this, I call it nurture, trust and nurture. There are these trust and nurture components that's, that clients expect from us. And I believe good business is built in the gaps. And as we watch our world become more and more AI and automation, I think we have to be the person who reminds them to be a human, to human nurture. Production. I really think so. Mm -hmm. So while I love automation, I don't know about you. When someone writes, sends me in the mail, like a handwritten thank you note, I want to hang it up on my fridge as if I'm a five-year-old who just drew a picture. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, someone sent me a card. Like that old school, someone's thinking about me. That is worth its weight in gold. I, so I, I heard a story of one of my coworkers where her dog died and she was using Chewy and they literally sent her a card and a painting of her dog because they get saw it on here. social media. Get out of here. And, but, and, and how many people has she told that story to? It's like, oh, that's so it. many. And you got to think too, like in that regard, you got to think they're losing a customer so their, their pet's dead, but the impact, I keep saying those personal moments, those moments of really seeing another human being, it has a ripple effect that it is does. immeasurable. It does. It does. And so I think, God, that's such a great example. That's it's, it's that fine line of like, let's make our lives easier. Let's automate the things that are automatable, but let's not over process to the point where we're not able to connect because that's yeah. where we're going to start to lose. And the stylist or the, the business owner that finds a way to connect like Chewy, which is a multi-million dollar massive organization, but it's the person, they, they call it scaling the inscalable. So they can't do a painting for every single person who loses a pet. I don't think maybe they can, I don't know, but it's those little moments of like, well, what can we do to make one person's day? What can we do? Yeah, it's to not like this person was a big social media influencer and everything, nope. but let me tell you where everybody heard about it more. Right. One -on -one. And I switched to that company because of that story. Cause there at least go. I felt like those people care there whether they sent me anything or not. They cared. <laughs> and that goes back to the values and the vulnerability and the authenticity we talked about before. It's like, that's such a small way you can show that it's huge. You know, it's funny because I think about you know, that personal touch. And I think personal touch is such a huge, huge impact, you know, back in the day, and it seems very unrelated, but it, I swear it is <laughs> when, um, I, I, my kids and, you know, I was originally from Long Island, New York, and my kids grew up there, my older ones. And there was a whole set of moms that were doing the birthday parties and they went to those big places and they would spend tons and tons of money. I did not have a lot of money. We were poor as heck. So what I would do is I would hunt down these like museums that were a dollar to get in. And I would make these whole things where I would have pretend dinosaur eggs and this and that. And we would, it would cost me 50 bucks for that, bake cupcakes and stuff. It cost me 50 bucks, a little effort for sure. 
to this day, these kids still talk about those parties. They don't remember the others. And the reason I say that is because that personal impact that you have of, of caring enough that you, yes, part of it is necessity, but it's also the care you put into it is remarkable. I love that you brought that up. And I think that for so long, I, I've talked about this too, when it relates to small business, like people thought like, oh, you got to serve champagne to really blow people's socks off. And it, it's just not, that's not what it's about anymore. It's, no, it's, they were blown away that I made like rocks out of old paper bags and crumpled yes. it up and covered furniture with it. And then yes. made like fake dinosaur eggs to eat. Yes. They were more impressed with the cheap food that I made and how I presented it. Um, than anything that was just buying and throwing in front of them. It's so true. It's like, do it with your heart and, and have the great intentions. And you're the one who's going to get the payoff. I totally I agree. love that. So I, here's my next question, because I, I think this is something that affects everybody, especially right now. We're in a recession. I mean, it's kind of out there. Everybody knows there's a few deniers, but come on, we're in a recession. Uh, <laughs> and that affects businesses, no matter what, small and big. When it comes to small business owners, you know, I always say that like something that is not great can sometimes be an opportunity. What opportunities do you see in the recession when it comes to small businesses, stylists, salons, any kind of service orientated, which sometimes suffers from that? I love this question. And um, I'm not of that very small sect who's like, oh, recession's not coming. Okay, we're in it, friends. Let's just yeah. own it. Okay, yeah. so, so now that we're owning it. Um, we're in an interesting time because I'm looking at a graph right now as we were, as we were hopping on this podcast, you were saying, you know, a lot of people now are starting their own businesses and you can look this up. I'm looking at Statista, but there's a lot of places that report this, you know, generally speaking every year, they, there'd be 250,000, 700,000 small businesses started. There were more businesses started in the last year than ever on history before we are seeing this huge boom Yes. And, and people starting business. It's massive. And there's this whole idea of wanting to, to kind of do your own thing and be self-made and, and run your own show, which I think is exciting. One of the things that I'm a Gary Vaynerchuk follower, it's not everybody, he's not everybody's cup of tea and I get it. Um, one of the things he says is it scares me that not enough people have been punched in the face. And what he means is it's easy to build a business when life is going well. It's really difficult when there's a recession or a curveball hits. Um, and it's kind of like what evens the playing field. So Here's the other thing in the beauty industry that compounds onto that. We lost about 100,000 beauty professionals between 2020 and 2021. Um, some were salon owners that just retired, walked away. Some were stylists who weren't really building well and decided, you know, I'm going to go corporate or who, who the heck knows, walked away. So, so we're actually in this interesting, um, interesting, very short-term situation where there is a surplus of clients. Yes. So a lot of stylists right now are like, actually, I came out of 2020 doing pretty good. And I keep saying, mm, don't get too comfortable because on the flip side of that, there are more people joining beauty school right now than ever before. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look this up. The U.S. Department of Bureau and Labor and Statistics is actually reporting on it. Our industry is expected to grow faster than most any other over the next eight years. Really? That's exciting. It is, except but for the scary at the same time. The competition's about to get stiff. Yeah. Um, because the client surplus that we're experiencing right now is not going to be here in three years. And so what I think is important, so all of these factors, I think it's important to know. What I think is important heading into a recession, compounding with the fact that we're going to have a lot of beauty professionals jumping in and they're going to be hungry and they're going to be educated is that per, I call it per, the perceived value factor and the demand margin you create. You can't just look great, pretty on social media. You can't just do neck and shoulder massages in the salon. You can't just do good consultations. You can't just do killer hair color. You can't just use the best hair care extension line. You can, it's not going to be enough. And to what we were talking about, it's going to come down to nurture and trust and showing up using those X factors and being different and finding the gap. If you look like everybody else, you're not going to make a wave in the ocean you're going to have to dig a little deeper. And in a time where consumers do get a little tight with their money, you got to be the lighthouse. You got to be the escape. You got to, you have to show up in a way I call it the perceived value, which is the difference between what a guest believes they're getting mm -hmm. and how much they pay. 
the bigger the gap between those two, the faster you'll grow your business. If they feel like they're getting a steal, like, oh, why would I, why would I stop going to see Brit? I get way more than I pay for when I go in to see her. You'll never lose a client again. But that doesn't necessarily equate to lowering your prices. That not at all equates to giving the value. Exactly right. It has nothing to do with lowering the prices and everything to do to pouring more value back in. And I think in this recession, so in 2008, the recession was based on a a crumbling housing market. We're seeing little trickles of that, but that's not what's going to spark this one. It's the the, uh, astounding inflation that we have. Mm. So in 2008, 2009, 2010, 11, 12, it was the coupon, the discounts, the Groupons, the save the money. I don't think we're going to have that this time around but people are going to be picky as all get out. Um, I think it's going to be that they're willing to spend the money, but they're not going to be reckless anymore. They're not going to be like, well, Sally's done my hair for 10 years. She's fine. Uh, If Sally's not looking sharp anymore, Angela's going to get the clients instead of Sally. And so it's time for Sally to step it up a little bit in the way that she serves her guests, in the way that she serves her community. That's what's going to make the difference in this recession. I love that. I think that is... um... And it's a lot of factors to play it I is. Mean, between obviously you can't do one and not the other. You still have to do your social media game. You still have to be interactive in that way, but you still have to have that kind of human connection that is really far superior than anybody else. That care, that tenderness, um, that if anything in the service industry, and I, again, I don't care if you're a stylist, a manicurist, a massage therapist, uh, you know, whatever it may be that could be in the service industry. Um, if you are not giving that extra care, you might just get overlooked or pushed out of the market over time. It's true. It's true. Consumers are not becoming less willing to spend. You can see it in the economic reports. They're spending oh, yeah. money, but they're very particular. And that's why we're seeing even well-established brands having to close their doors because the consumer is just more particular. And so we can say it's annoying. We can say we don't want to play the social media game. We don't want to have to up our game. It doesn't matter what we want as the business owner. The consumer is demanding it and it's it's time for us to get sharp. And the, the irony is for so many years in the beauty industry, especially we said we wanted to be more well-respected. We didn't want to be, you know, the kitchen cosmetologist. We wanted to be seen as true professionals. You got it. Yep. I was going to say that's always been a little bit of a, a thing with us because, you know, we felt like, oh, you know, no one really respects what we do. They think we're just these people that do it on the fly and they could do it at home as well. Now they're starting to realize no, especially after 2020. They realize, I mean, I could do some stuff, but not as good as I thought I could. Right. So there is value that suddenly has been put on us, but there's got to be more. Yep. You got to wow. live in it. You got to own it. You got to own that respect. You know, it's, it's like time for us to step up and live in it too. I loved this conversation. Like I, so. I feel as though there is so such a wonderful scope of information that I just learned myself. And I thank you so much. Absolutely. My pleasure. This was so much fun. Thank you for holding the space and and having such a powerful conversation with me. I appreciate you. And I want to remind everybody to go and take a look at the thriving stylist, whether you are a stylist or if you're in the service industry, there's so much valuable information. I was actually even going through it this morning. Again, I revisited a few I listened to a long time ago and I was like, well, I remember that one. Um, (laughs) But not just that. I think that um, she has all her different social platforms. These are all great, valuable information that's out there for you to follow, please take a look at it. And thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. 